I've been in my D&D group for two years now, and overall it's been smooth. We've made it through four campaigns together. Things have been rocky though, since we went online, but like, that's bound to happen. My DM is a good guy, I thought, and has been an acquaintance bordering on friend. He's six years older than me, so we're not super close, but I respect him and enjoy his campaigns. About a month ago, he asked me if I'd be interested in doing stuff before one of our sessions. I said, sure, figuring he meant like having coffee at the park or something. So when he invited me to his house, I was confused since this was during the pandemic and we weren't really on alone in each other's apartments terms. When I asked him what was going on, he confessed he felt a real connection while playing and was interested in me in that way. Honestly, I was pretty upset because he knows I have a girlfriend, I'm by, who used to hang out at sessions with us even. He said he didn't know we were still together and apologized and reassured me it wouldn't make the game weird. Well, that was a big old lie. In the first two sessions, he's been extremely cold to me as a person and treats my character like garbage. She's a tabaxi cleric and he's done all he can to make her absolutely useless. Every single skill check I make fails regardless of simplicity. Every idea of mine just won't work. He just sits back and acts incredibly bored whenever it's my turn. Some of the other players and I have brought it up and he denies it. When I accused him of being unfair, he said he used to treat me special because he liked me. But now that he knows I'm not interested, he's apparently being fair and tells me I'm just not good at D&D. This dude is gross in so many ways, not least of which flirting with somebody who is already in a committed relationship. But after that, the pettiness of the D&D &D game targeting is just next level pathetic. I would say I've never seen anything like this before, but anyone who's been at this tavern long enough would know that would be a straight lie. Long time players will basically already get this one. Yeah, it's that guy DMing. TLDR DM starts a goblin war campaign, Ranger takes favored enemy goblins, and suddenly the quarter million goblin horde just cannot be found by the party. Party eventually tries to march on their capital. There are other bits, but this is the main thrust. DM called us together for a goblin war campaign. He straight out called it that out of the box. This was back during 3.5 and we had a session zero. Not called at the time, but we still use them. We wanted everyone to be tied into the goblins in some manner to give us some investment. Characters as follows. Human ranger, me, dwarven cleric of Morden, halfling rogue, elven wizard. So we all tied our backgrounds into it in a variety of ways. My character had grown up on the fringes of goblin territory, becoming a ranger like his father before him. I took point blank shot and precise shot for my two feet, basically just letting me be able to shoot into melee without the minus four penalty. I also took favored enemy, goblins. Note, goblins in 3.5 were an independent species of humanoids, not fey. Simple enough, I get plus two to hit and damage against goblinoids, and a plus two to track and other such skills against them. Everyone was really amped, we're talking about how we get our own Battle of Helms deep. We were ready to go. Halfling came from a village that had been raided and taken over by hobgoblins and was looking to free her people from their bondage. The elven wizard was pretty much going after the goblins because he knew what they would do to the forest to build their war machine up. Dwarven Cleric. Well, they were pretty much born with a grudge against goblins, so that one was sort of a gimme. It started off fine. We got word of a massive goblin horde, numbering in the hundreds of thousands on the march and coming straight for our kingdom. They were raising and pillaging the lands as they went. We, and others, were quickly conscripted into a militia, and given our specialized abilities, we were banded together as a group to carry out special attacks. Our first mission was to go after the vanguards, who would be coming ahead of the main horde. This amounted to bandit activities, but with goblins instead of humans. We went out, and it was going quite well. I took point as ranger, sniffing out ambush spots, and we were all doing fairly consistent damage, but not much in the way of crits or fumbles, so it was going about average. Since we all had horses and I'm a ranger, I suggested that we should train at least my horse to be able to aid in tracking, since horses do have scent as a special ability. The group agreed with the idea, and we took what time we could between missions working on it. Then at level 3, something changed. Our mission stopped being about goblins and started being about generic adventure affair. We figured, alright, this is cool, this gives us some other stuff to do and breaks up the goblin stuff for a while. It was nice at first, we got away from the same old bad guys, but it started to drag on to the point where a couple of sessions went by in-game with nothing but the side quests. 
I finally just decided that we should probably get back to the warfront, which we were still getting word of going on, and we set out. We were level 6 by this point, and I had my animal companion, a wolf we had gotten studded leather armor and a saddle for, so that the halfling could ride it. She was psyched about the trip attack slash stab combo. So I rolled a tracking check to figure out what direction the horde was from us as we rode. Got a 34, I nat 20 on the check, and I was informed that there was absolutely no trace of them. I thought the DM was doing a deadpan thing, but, but no, he was adamant. We couldn't find this horde. So checking our notes, we went by one of the towns we knew had been recently sacked and tried again. This time I got 27 to track a quarter million people marching in formation with siege engines, mounts and the like, and again, nothing. Not a trace? Okay, we got spells to help us out. Nothing. We checked for traces of magic that might be hiding the army's movements. Again, nope. Across three full sessions, we were pulling out every trick we could think of for finding this horde and just, just nothing. Meanwhile, we're getting beset by monsters. The rogue was kind of loving it since she was making incredibly efficient use of her sneak attack. That's when the next bit changed. We stopped encountering anything with an anatomy. Seriously, it all started being aberrations, undead, oozes, or if we did pull a humanoid, they had protection against flank slash sneak attack. When I got my next favorite enemy, I decided to test a theory and took undead. Surprise, surprise, the undead problem suddenly just evaporated. Next, we perfected our strategies for flanking oozes, and again, suddenly, they were just gone from the world. This is where we finally stopped, and between sessions came to a unanimous decision. Beginning of the next session, we pointed to the goblin capital on the map, stated we were running to sack it. This startled the DM. But, but the horde is to the south of you. Um, no. We checked south. Pretty thoroughly, the rogue said. So we figured there's going to be goblins to fight in their capital. We might just be able to draw the enemy back towards us to stop us from breaking their supply lines. Classic military strategy, really, the wizard replied. We went around for several more minutes detailing how this was our best shot, and the DM is steadily turning a shade of purple. It was the cleric who called an end to it. Thing is, we wouldn't have to do this if you weren't making it impossible to find the main plot of your campaign. We didn't want to go here, but what's our other option? I almost stuck in my own input, but got the mom eye from the rogue. DM finally fessed up. When we had kept spotting ambushes and were acting very strategic from the start, he got scared we were going to face roll the whole campaign, so he shunted us off. Then apparently the rogue started getting regular sneak attack hits in and it threw him off further. Then combined myself and the cleric going against the undead and he pulled the undead out too. He finishes his rant about stuff and it was quiet for a moment when the wizard said, you know, you could have just given the goblins class levels, right? Wait, I can what? I do empathize with DMs to deal with players who are just more powerful than what they anticipated, but at the same time, guys, this is not the solution. There are many solutions to this problem that most of the time isn't even a problem at all. First and foremost, it's okay if your players have some easy fights. That's good. If every fight is down to the wire, it's just gonna make your campaign overly stressful. Look, if you've seen Shadow over Kerkonos, you know I love a tense battle. I love it when things are down to the wire. I love it when there's that rush of adrenaline. Like, oh my god, this is intense. This is great. I love that, but not every fight needs to be that, especially in a long-form campaign. Also, if you do want to make things intense, if you want that intense boss fight, that's great too. Again, I love that kind of thing, but never just cancel out your player character's abilities. Don't just say, oh yeah, uh, in this fight, your rogue sneak attack just doesn't work at all. Why? I mean, I just don't want it to. That's lame. Don't do that. Why even let them take the ability at all? Why allow rogues in your campaign if you're not going to let them do the thing that they're best at? Look, balancing combat is not easy. I empathize with that problem, but don't invalidate player abilities in order to create balance because then you're just going to take away fun. And there's not really much point if there's no fun, is there? This was a few years ago, I was a DM slash admin for a Discord West Marches server that Matt Coville used to advertise in the lower half of his video descriptions. I DM'd for this woman, I'll call her Ash in the UK and three of her friends, and a random that just joined the last second, we'll call him Gurm. He was our last as we could fit five players. Gurm just wanted to see how the game was going to work, so they joined 20 minutes early and we talked in the voice chat for a bit. The other players came in and we got started. Gurm went silent as soon as everyone came in. 
I couldn't help but chuckle to myself. He seemed young, so maybe he didn't feel comfortable talking to women yet. So I made all the tokens while Ash and her friends talked for a bit, and when I asked for everyone to introduce themselves, when I put together, Gurm typed that their mic wasn't working. I felt bad for him for a bit. We've all been there, choked up when the girls are around. We get to the end of the game after the players fight a bunch of gnolls and undead. Bit of bragging, but it was one of my finest games I've ever DM'd. Gurm finally pipes up and says, That was a great game, Ash. Thank you for inviting me. I thought that that was weird since Gurm uh, invited himself. But I smile and think, Oh good, finally breaking the ice. Ash just starts screaming for Gurm to go... Oh... <laughs> That was unexpected. I mute everyone for a moment and then pull Ash into a room and ask what is going on? Why is she acting like that to some poor kid? She tells me that as an admin, I should know. I explained I didn't. I was so new and I asked her to explain. Turns out that this Gurm guy has been harassing her for months in this server. So I look back in the logs that we kept on a Google Doc. It's all of the incidents and bans in the history of the server. And I find about three to four dozen reports of the same guy finding a way around the ban to get back into the server. He worms his way into every game she's in and then proceeds to send her his creepy fanfic of what they did in that session. I insta ban Gurm's account after seeing his newest message. The line that will always stick with me is, and her sweaty feet squish the gnoll's head like a rotten watermelon. I talk to Ash again for a bit and tell her I will find a way to keep them from getting back into the server. We close down the server for a bit and re-interview everyone on the server. Have them talk to us for a few minutes to see if it's the same guy or not. Got rid of three or four accounts that were suspected to be clones of Gurm. We open the server back up and make audio interviews mandatory to join the server. All this headache because this guy couldn't just not be a creep. TLDR, creep stalks girl, and writes bad fanfic. The wonders of online D&D are endless. We can play with people halfway across the world. That's just straight sci-fi stuff. And it's amazing. It's great. But sometimes it can be really not amazing. And this is one of those times. It's very unfortunate that this happened. Though I am glad to see that the Discord team that was running the server took it so seriously. I mean, I'm really happy to see that a lot of admins will just blow it off and let Gurm just keep on making their alt accounts. But here... The team took it seriously and closed down the whole server for a bit to try and figure out this issue and started making audio interviews mandatory to stop this guy from getting in. I'm not happy that the situation happened, obviously, but I am happy to see that people actually took it seriously and took care of the problem. This is also why small talk to me is really important. Everyone talking to each other before the game can expose a lot about people, not just the good things, but also some of the things you might want to avoid. And Gurm is definitely someone you want to avoid. I'm a lesbian, and I promise this is unfortunately relevant. Not sure if this needs a content warning, but I'm going to include one just in case. Some backstory that leads me to this particular group of players. I've had the itch to play D&D since quarantine began, but have been too afraid to take the plunge into online sessions. I used to play at a table with my wife and our close friends, but that campaign fizzled out after the DM wrote himself into a corner and general life things happened, you know, retail jobs, adulting, what can you do? After finally kicking my social anxiety to the curb and mustering up the courage to join a few D&D servers, I found a couple of games that interest me, so I went ahead and applied. This would be my first foray into 5th edition, and I was excited. I was accepted into two campaigns, the first of which I'm still in, and even running a campaign of my own for the same group. But this post isn't about the first campaign, this is about the second one. The general game concept was that a group of longtime friends had to leave their village because of a prophecy which had the potential to change the world. It was promised to be very roleplay heavy, which I was pretty excited about. After a preliminary voice call interview with the DM, current members of the group, and another potential member, I was feeling good. The DM seemed chill, no one was homophobic at the mention of my wife, and everyone was pretty nice. The character pitch that got me accepted to the campaign was a human bard with a flair for the dramatic and a love of sleight of hand magic tricks to entertain the village's children. While not born in the village, he'd arrived as a child with his mentor, where the pair performed in the town square to make a living. He was left behind while his mentor left on business, and upon finding out they had to leave the village, he looked at the silver lining of being able to search for his missing mentor. Little did I know that the only part that would stick out to the DM would be flair for the dramatic and the character's custom art, which featured a sunset celestial cape and some colorful hand scarves. 
This takes a couple of sessions to rear its ugly head, but boy, did it. The meat of the cringe. From the beginning, I was expected to be an integral part of this village and friends with the other player characters despite not having access to their backstories or knowing anything about them. Okay, I could roll with that. I was confident enough in my role-playing ability to handle improvising, and the first session went decent enough despite having been dropped into the campaign's third session with the bare minimum information of the previous sessions. I'm talking not even a recap levels of dropped in. Again, I could roll with that. Another new player was also joining in the same session. She played the Chief and Cleric. There was some great roleplay between our characters. The cleric was anxious about being forced to leave the church she had grown up in, and my bard made her a flower crown from the church's garden so she'd have a memento of her home. And he did the same thing for the other's characters. It was sweet. When I asked if we could add the crowns to our inventories, I was met with a very rude, haha, <laughs> no. The problems began arising immediately after the first session ended. The cleric's player left the session, and the DM began to trash talk both the character and player while the other established players joined in. Like the cleric had been gone maybe 10 seconds before they started up and it happened that fast. At that point, I had spoken to this group a grand total of twice. They agreed to boot her from the campaign as I just sat in silence. I should have left after this first glaring red flag, but I was desperate to play D&D. By the time my second session with this group rolled around, things got worse. You know how some friends show affection by making off-color jokes at each other? The sort of jokes that could be seen as insults were not for the years of bonding everyone has gone through? Yeah, the DM was making those sort of jokes at me despite knowing them for a grand total of two weeks and having only spoke to them a handful of times. Like, sorry man, you're not exactly at high enough friendship levels to make gay jokes about me and my wife nor to be making jokes about my insecurities. The jokes never veered into homophobic territory, but they're a little too close for comfort. These <clears throat> jokes aside, I was determined to try and stick it out. Roleplay was decent while the other players reciprocated. I spent a lot of time during sessions feeling like I was the only one trying to roleplay or move the session forward. I'd say something and there would be extremely long silences before the DM would try to come in and railroad the party forward. This happened, unfortunately, a lot, with the worst instance detailed below. The party finally found the prophecy that got us kicked out of the village, and we learned we'd be hunted just for being mentioned in said prophecy. Life on the run began, and we had a destination in mind, the Earth Kingdom. Imagine, you're in a grassland with no discernible features, you've never left your village before, and you've been forced to leave prematurely on the threat of death, and everyone knew why except for you, and they refused to tell you why because you'll find out yourself. You don't even have a map, and when you finally come across some small stones in this vast expanse of green, you think, hey, something man-made, this will lead us somewhere so we can get our bearings. Haha. <laughs> Nope, the first hour of the third session was spent walking through an empty field following something the DM put importance on, only for it to be revealed that they led to nothing and were leading us in the wrong direction. What a waste of a nat 20. We couldn't even know it was the wrong direction because the DM had no world map, not even vague MS Paint scribbles, to show us as players where in the world things were located. So not only were we left with the vaguest directions on where to go or how the kingdoms were set up, but any attempt I made at roleplay was met with silence as I, a bard, led the party in the wrong direction at the DM's insistence for a real world hour. I was very nearly bored to tears and frustration as I was the only one putting in effort and I felt like a fool for having been led on by the DM and, and left feeling like my character was disliked by the party because there was zero attempt to roleplay in a roleplay heavy campaign? We then found a nomadic village where we had our first encounter with the sand assassins who were hunting us. After combat, our characters were all but chased away by the villagers, which the DM insisted was emotionally difficult, even though the characters had only been there for a day and a half. It was during the session that the jokes about my human bard being a gay tiefling started. Our characters had wanted posters that featured their general descriptions, and mine was solely focused on being a colorful, and I guess therefore gay, tiefling. Everyone else's were pretty accurate, and they were elves slash half-elves, but no. The human with easily identifiable features and clothing is clearly a colorful tiefling. We meet a new NPC who has knowledge about the situation. Oh, you're the gay tiefling every single time. Listen, I'll make gay jokes till the cows come home. My wife and I make them constantly. My friends and I make them all the time. Hell, even in my other group, I make the I'm gay and I can't do math meme on a regular basis as I mess up adding up my damage rolls. Eight plus four does nine equal 10? But I do draw the line of these jokes being made at my expense by someone I barely know, 
or when all other aspects of my character are ignored because he has one gay stereotype in his personality. Non-horny bard who's confident in himself, tries to cheer up his friends in spite of their dire circumstances, would commit murder for them, and loves the art of performance because it makes people smile, but also because it's just fun? Nah, he's totally gay. Did I mention that my character never flirted with anybody, male, female, or otherwise? The DM just incorrectly decided that my character was gay and made every interaction revolve around that assumption, even though I constantly corrected him while reiterating that my bard was just a showman by nature who enjoyed making people laugh with his antics. The DM also really wanted to give our characters emotional damage, and the following session was also spent trying to force us to feel, I don't know, traumatized, powerless. Our characters lost in an in-game year while inside some trial. My bard's reaction was just, oh, well, that kind of sucks. Maybe the assassins think we're dead. Cool. Spoiler alert. The assassins did not think we were dead and knew exactly where we were despite not having seen us for a year. I'm all for character growth, inner conflict, etc., but just trying to force characters or players to feel something or constantly trying to force emotional damage on characters ain't it. I know I've typed a lot. Imagine hearing it six times a session from the DM, and boy, did this DM try to force it. I lasted four or five sessions with that group, and after skipping once because the thought of sitting through the railroaded emotional damage our characters were subjected to, the gay jokes and the hostile NPCs made me dread the idea of even playing with these people, I realized I was better off focusing on the other campaign I was in, so I left. And I regret not leaving after the first red flag at the end of the first session. Thanks for reading this train wreck of a post, sorry it's long, this took place over several sessions, and while I feel is relevant to the story, others might not. I hope you learn from my experience and avoid making the same mistakes. There is a lot to dissect in this post, so let's get into it. First and foremost, the joking around. Like the OP said, these kind of jokes are okay among friends, but when you're taking jabs at other people that you barely know, it comes off as extremely alienating and hostile. I have unfortunately experienced this not in D&D, but in the workplace. There was a woman who was constantly making jokes about my interests, my work, my sexual orientation even occasionally. And while those jokes would be harmless among my friends, this person was not my friend. I didn't even know their name. And so their behavior came off as abrasive and annoying, to say the least. I did not enjoy working with them. That is the workplace. This is Dungeons & Dragons, a game we're playing for fun. Alienation in a D&D group really, really sucks when you're supposed to be working together to build this story and to have a good time. Not surprising considering they immediately alienated the cleric player without hesitation during the first session that she joined. So yeah, not exactly surprising coming from a group like this. On top of that, the DM just doesn't see very good at their job. Boring travel sessions can make you want to pull your hair out and this DM just forced the party to go through it. Forced emotional damage also really doesn't work, especially since First and foremost, some people might not be comfortable with that, but second of which, if it doesn't work, it just comes off as really cringy. I'm sorry, there's no other word for it, but when players are not buying in, it just, it does not work at all. And yeah, it did not work at all here. Thank God that this OP left the group fairly quickly. Players in this story. Peters, the DM that asked for nudes. Carl, my other male friend, met this DM five years ago. We became fast friends and had a lot of the same interest. Had some fun times. I also met most of my current D&D party through his games. So, something good came out of this at least. Anyways, Peter's had a crush on me, asked me out. I said nah, moved on. A couple years later, he asked me for nudes. I say nah again, and we move on. Again, with me telling him it's fine that he asked, see me. Fool. He was very clearly into me, so obviously the other players in the game would make jokes about it. It was cringe, and it was very clear to him that I never reciprocated. Still, he persisted. Around this time, Peter started to get territorial. Carl was one of my close friends, and Peters would constantly condescend, argue with, and just generally be an asshole to him, to the point where Carl almost left the group because of it. Even if Carl was 100% right, Peters would go out of his way to prove Carl was wrong, or pull the, well, I just don't see it that way, BS. They argued about how elf trance worked for a week. And Peters was wrong, by the way. I talked to Peters about his crappy attitude a few times, 
but nothing ever changed. It got worse when I started DMing. Peters literally nuked an entire campaign because he didn't like how the rest of the party was playing. He would, during break, take one of the players, Carl, into a private call and rage about how everyone else was playing. Campaign after that, I split the group to figure out who the problem was, and he forcefully ended the campaign early via throwing a portable hole into a bag of holding. I could have salvaged it, but by that point, it was that obvious who the problem was, so I just ended it. I kicked him out of my next campaign and told him why. Now for the fun part. I ended up talking to some of my other friends who were part of his games, all female presenting keep in mind, and we discovered that Peters asked us all for, for titty pics. Oh god, I'm getting Arcadum flashbacks. That's also why I don't play Among Us. No, stop, stop, stop that right now. Let's all just... Get back to the story. Anyway, he would also call while drunk off his ass, something I managed to avoid by not accepting cold calls on Discord. He was also telling one of the other female players that there was nothing between him and I, while at the same time he was trying to get with me, saying crap like, I just want to wake up next to you. True player behavior. That group conversation was the impetus for us all leaving the Discord at once. It was during the conversation that provoked everyone to leave at once when the husband of one of the female players was contacted by Peters with some guilt-trippy BS about how us leaving seemed like a coordinated effort. Husband responded with a, Maybe if you didn't ask all of your female friends for titty pics, including my wife, they wouldn't have ghosted you. Funniest crap I've ever seen. The whole thing is just weird to me. I've never before been in a situation where someone was so blatantly an asshole and explicit and weird. It just makes you think, is this actually, is this actually happening whenever he would do something? I think that's partially the reason we let it go on for so long without saying anything. That and not wanting to rock the boat. He was the DM after all. If we pissed him off, we'd probably get kicked and not get to hang out with our friends. Another example was constant CSA jokes about him and his dad, none of which, by his own admission, were true. How is that funny? And literally, literally baby talking to me if I had a headache. What's CSA? Oh god! Why would you joke about that? That's- oh my lord. So, yeah, I could honestly write horror story after horror story about his behavior, but this is pretty much a TLDR post. Moral of the story, call people out if they're being weird to your friends. Most of the time, people want to avoid rocking the boat so they'll take abuse or creepiness instead of speaking out and suffer in silence. Bit of a grim ending, but yes, unfortunately, that often is the case. Look, I understand how scary it is to speak out, especially if it is this degree of creepiness, but it's important to be open. Suffering in silence is called that for a reason. It's not exactly a wonderful feeling that you have when you know there's something wrong going on, but you feel like you can't do anything about it. And I know it's scary, but there are people out there who are willing to support you. While some people, some idiots, are gonna try to put the responsibility on you to help somebody who is hurting other people, who's hurting you even, it's not your responsibility. It's your job to take care of yourself. It's your job to make sure that you are okay. And if leaving the group is how you do that, then that's the way it is. Remember, taking care of yourself and making sure that you're okay is not selfishness. That's never selfishness. Now, with that being said, let's go on to the D&D stuff. Peters sucks. On top of all this nice guy garbage, Peters is also targeting Carl for no particular reason. Well, I mean, there is a reason. It's because he's friends with the girl that he likes. But, I mean, in-game, no particular reason. Add on top of that the fact that he is also trying to enforce his own playstyle upon the rest of the party, probably because he's just trying to nuke this girl's campaign, which is rude, don't do that. But yeah, all this behavior just totals into a not great person to play with, or just a not great person to be around. I mean, just to cap it off, if there are comparisons being drawn between you and Arcadum, you're doing something seriously wrong. All right, and that's going to be it for today's episode of RPG Horror Stories. If you guys enjoyed it, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can check out Shadow Over Caraconas, my actual play D&D podcast. And while you're there on the cards, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own storage thoughts, go down to the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment. You're asking for what? To let me know you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell. Thank you.